Koinonia House is a nonprofit Christian ministry that is supported by the purchasing of materials and donations. To learn more about Koinonia House and the materials that we have available, visit khouse.org. And please be responsible in the sharing and dissemination of this information and respect the copyrights therein. Thank you. Okay, um, we uh, will, God willing, deal with a number of subjects tonight, and uh, of course, uh, the conviction in a Swiss court uh, that I was uh, trying to defend Switzerland from Islam, and so I was convicted of the hate laws, uh, which, by the way, President uh, Obama wants to bring here to America, and before him, George W. also spoke of bringing these same hate laws here to America, so it's not personal with Obama, it's it's the mindset that anybody who attacks Islam uh, is a criminal. So, uh, and also, by the way, if you preach the gospel, that is a criminal act, if you speak against Islam. So uh, we're going to talk about that a little bit, and of course, uh, okay, so anyway, so uh, I want to talk primarily about four different items. The first, of course, is Switzerland and Europe, and the Islamic plans to overtake Europe which seems to be coming along very well. Their, their plan is to take over Europe. I want to talk about, the, of course, the conflict in the Middle East, the different conflicts that are taking place. Uh, by the way, none of them have anything to do with Israel, really. They're internal conflicts. I want to talk about the United States of America, and I want to talk about Israel. So these are four subjects. And of course, since Chuck Missler is my idol, and I, there are people even call me Avi Missler, you know. <laughs> If you get the Sleeping in America tape, you'll know what I'm talking about. And um, so I've learned from Chuck Missler uh, to ramble and, uh, <laughs> and sometimes even to come back to what I was originally saying. But there is a method to the madness and it, it usually works. So I want to start firstly with Switzerland. And I want to tell you that uh, uh, I have been to Switzerland many, many times. I started first going to Switzerland in 1996 to speak in a theological seminary, free evangelical the theological seminary in Basel. And um, in 2003, I was invited for the first time to work with the EDU, a Christian political party in Switzerland. And uh, this is, for example, the poster that came out uh, in 2009 uh, regarding the minarets. And we're going to talk about the minarets. I spoke about them, I think, in the past here, but this is going to be really the, the, the end of the story regarding the minarets. And uh, 2003 was very generic. It was just talking about Islam, the threat of Islam to Switzerland. And what I want to do is I want to talk about the history of the Islamic, uh, the, 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 the new third invasion. As you all know, the first invasion was Spain, 711 AD. And then you had the Turkish uh, invasion all the way up to the gates of Vienna. And I know I spoke about that here. And as you know, the Turks were pushed out of Europe over a period of centuries, just as the Arabs and the Moroccans were pushed out of Spain, Portugal, and France over a period of centuries. And uh, what we're seeing today in Europe is a third invasion, uh, a peaceful invasion, at the invitation of the European Christians. And my message to the Swiss was, hey, you know, you guys are forgetting your history. Now, I say Americans never learned the history in the first place. But, you know, the Europeans have a history of war, never-ending war with Islam. And um, it took the Spanish and the Portuguese 800 years to get rid of the Moors. Uh, it took the, the Russians, the Ukrainians, the Polish, the Austrians, the Hungarians, the Bulgarians, the Romanians, and the Greeks. It also took them about 800 years to finally push the Turks back into Turkey, and that happened by 1912. So we're talking about exactly 100 years ago. Now, Europe is kind of a crazy place, and I don't want to get into much to the history of the Americans. You know, the American people were rebels. All of you who are here tonight are rebels. Um, you know, the Puritans, the Pilgrims, the Mennonites, the Amish, the Quakers, all, the Huguenots, all these people 
fled Europe because they were true believing Christians in their way, and they were not tolerated by the main mainline churches and the kings of uh, Europe, and so they came to America. Many perished in these rickety ships going across the Atlantic. Um, many perished here uh, in the new, the new land of America, the colonies. I mean, anybody who was ready to give up what was, we call civilization in Europe and come to America, these were people with fighters' genes, rebels' genes. And uh, basically, the wimps stayed in Europe. And, and I want you to know, I'm forming a political party uh, in Israel, Judeo-Christian Bible Block Party, uh, based on the values that made America great. And those values are Christian values. And we don't have that in Israel. We have a different political system. Um, we have communist parties, Islamic parties, ultra-Orthodox parties. We have some nationalist parties, but we don't have... Judeo-Christian Western Civilization and Democracy Party, and Israel's Christian population has grown from 2% to 8%. And I've spoken about this here. I believe the Christian population will grow to 20 30% in the coming years. And so you need a political party that will address the Christian population and represent them. Remember the Tea Party, no taxation without representation. Now, the Europeans are a crazy bunch. We know they're wimps, and we know they're troublemakers. And the, the white Christian Europeans were slaughtering each other, not only for centuries, but for millennia. And um, you have, uh, all the way back to the Crusades, I mean, you had Catholics coming down from France and, and England and Germany and slaughtering Greek Christians. And uh, I mean, in those days, everybody was slaughtering everybody. It wasn't you know, just the way it was in those days. Um, of course, you know that, uh, getting down to more modern times, you know that the the Spanish nearly controlled the world. Uh, the French, under Napoleon, conquered the Spanish. Uh, the Spanish were fighting the British. The French were fighting the British. The French were fighting the Spanish. Uh, they were fighting the Germans. Uh, the Germans were fighting the Russians. Uh, the Yugoslavs are one people. The, the Bosnians, the Croats, and the Serbs, they were all slaughtering each other for centuries. And so everybody's slaughtering everybody, and everybody's white, and everybody's Christian. Everybody's European. And uh, at the end of World War II, the uh, people of Europe all of a sudden started saying, are we crazy? Why are we killing each other? By the way, the United States knew this. <laughs> the United States did not want to get into World War I, and the United States succeeded in not getting into World War I until, as you know, the Germans made a deal with the Mexicans to give them back to the Southwest, and of course the Germans were torpedoing American ships. So America went into World War I at the very end, was in World War I in one year, uh, ended the war and saved the world. And then America went back to isolationism again. And then came World War II. And of course, World War II wasn't only a European war, it was also a Japanese war. But then again, America really said, you know, we don't want to get involved in a strange foreign war, which is what it was. And uh, of course, the Japanese were conquering uh, China and Mongolia and uh, Manchuria and Korea. And the, the Libyans uh, were conquering, uh, the, the Italians were conquering Libya and Ethiopia and Somalia, and, and that's in the 30s. And Germany, of course, was expanding. And, uh, you know, in America, saw World War I break out in 1939, and America said, you know, it's not our war. It's a crazy European war, and rightfully so. So everybody complains about, you know, European countries and Canada. They didn't want to help out in Iraq. But the fact is, when the Canadi when you were, if you were an American and you wanted to fight Hitler, you had to go up to Canada to join the, the Royal Air Force to go fight, you know, the Canadian military to go fight. Anyway, the Japanese attack, Pearl Harbor, December 7, 1941, and uh, all of a sudden America finds itself in a war again. Okay, so let's go back to the Europeans. The Europeans, after World War II, uh, you know, see 60, 70 million people dead. And the Europeans said, you know, this is crazy. We should never do this again. And I think it's a blessing that finally the Europeans woke up and said we shouldn't be killing each other. So the number one rule of the European Union, no more war, which is great. I think it's a very big accomplishment. Um, the second conclusion was that Europe should be a welfare state. Okay, now welfare state is good if you have a lot of young people uh, uh, you know, plowing money into the Ponzi scheme, because welfare state is a Ponzi scheme. Now, the third conflicting conclusion was 
that families should not have children. And so um, I have some very dear Christian friends in Switzerland who said to me that the 50 million Muslims in Switzerland are God's punishment for the Europeans aborting 50 million children. Had the Europeans not carried out 50 million abortions, there would have been no need for young labor coming in from the Islamic countries. So you have the conflicting desire for a welfare state with a very truncated infrastructure to pay for the welfare state. Now, and we're going to come back to this later, you know, America has 12 million illegals. Most of these illegals are Hispanic. And uh, Hispanic, most of them are Christian, different type of Christian, perhaps. And these Hispanics are not here to destroy America. They're here to feed their families. Uh, the Europeans do not have that luxury. Europeans uh, import primarily Muslims. There are also some uh, uh, blacks from Africa who are not Muslim, but primarily it's Muslims coming into France. Don't forget also that uh, Morocco, Tunisia, Algeria were French colonies. And when France pulled out of these three countries, these people had the opportunity, I don't want to say the right, but they had the opportunity to move to France, and many of them did. And of course, the Germans were importing Gastarbeiter, or guest workers, from Turkey and Yugoslavia. Again, if, 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 a, if a nation or if a continent says it's bad to have children, then uh, you're going to have to import children to do the work. That's what happened in Europe. Uh, a very important turning point came in 1973. 1973, you all remember probably the Yom Kippur War between Israel and the Egyptians and the Syrians, in which the Egyptians and Syrians attacked Israel in a sneak attack on Israel's holiest day, Yom Kippur. And uh, I don't know, how many people remember the gas rationing lines at the gas stations? Okay, and you know, many times you're driving and you go up to a gas station, guess what, they're out of gas. Uh, so they had the same problem in Europe. And the Europeans, unlike the Americans, uh, do not have any oil, really. In 1973, they had a problem. They didn't really have oil. And so the European leadership cried out uh, for Islamic mercy. And uh, the Muslims uh, negotiated with them an agreement in 1973. And it's called the Eurabia Agreement. The Eurabia Agreement is like this. The Islamic world will provide Europe with all the oil they need on a number of conditions. Condition number one, unlimited Islamic migration into European countries. Number two, giving the Muslims mosques and all the, what they need uh, for religious purposes. Uh, number three, uh, to attack Israel in the UN. Always vote against Israel. I don't know if you ever noticed that the United Nations, the, the, United, the Europeans always condemn Israel. If the Arabs call for a resolution saying that the world, that, like the world is flat, the Europeans will vote for it. <laughs> Whatever the Muslims say, the Europeans will say yes because they need the oil. Um, so anyway, so this helps to explain the mentality of uh, Europe today, and Switzerland is exactly in the heart of Europe. By the way, the same Christian friends who told me about the 50 million abortions in Europe also told me that incest is legal in Switzerland, homosexuality is legal in Switzerland, and if you attack either of them, you go to jail. Because if it's legal and you attack the law, then you go to jail. Uh, they also said to me that in certain mainline churches in Switzerland, people take their dogs and cats and other pets to be baptized. So obviously, you know, my work in Switzerland is primarily with born-agains, and very deeply conservative Christians. But the, like in America, where I would be so bold as to say that I believe 60 to 70% of the American people are Christians. Of course, different shades, different types of Christians, but that's okay, they're Christian. America is a Christian country, it always has been. But the people who rule America are anti-Christian. You have a small minority of liberals and they control the country. The same applies in Switzerland. Okay. Now, like I said before, my first trip to Switzerland as part of the EDU uh, Christian Party was in 2003. And, you know, these, these Swiss uh, people are very quiet. They're very sweet. They're very stoic. You don't really see emotion in them. And they come to Israel twice a year to visit. And then they call me, say, come 
visit us uh, in the Ramat Rachel Hotel, Ramat Rachel Kibbutz Hotel. So I go to see them and they always present me with a bar of Swiss chocolate. <laughs> and I'm on to them. So when I go, I present them with a bar of Israeli chocolate. <laughs> and whenever I go to Switzerland, I take quite a few bars of Israeli chocolate to show them th that we are on the same level. I have a sense of humor too, you know. So anyway, January 2009, Werner Scherer of the ADU comes to me and comes and says, Avi, you did a great service for Switzerland in 2003. We need you again, 2009. I said, what's the problem? And he said, the Muslims want to build minarets. Now, the minarets are these tall spires that you see alongside the mosque. It's not a mosque. It is a spire. It is a, like a long tower. And some people say, like a church steeple. Excuse me, no, it isn't. And um, he said, we have to block the minarets. They already have four built. And we submitted uh, a plan for a national vote, national referendum, as to whether to allow the Swiss, the, the Muslims, to build minarets in Switzerland. They have their mosques. There are 400 mosques in Switzerland. And, you know, well, listen, the, the, the Muslims everywhere are at least 10% of the population in every country in Europe, if not 15 or 20%. So anyway, so this is called the Inneret Minaret Initiative. And the idea behind that was two political parties, the EDU, which is actually a very small Christian conservative party, uh, worked together with the Volksparty, the People's Party in Switzerland. And uh, nobody believed for a moment that the EDU and the VP would actually succeed in defeating the minarets. And uh, at the end of the day, the Swiss government was asleep. The Swiss TV, Channel One, was asleep. And praise God, November 29th, 2009, there was a national vote. And 57% of the Swiss people voted against minarets. And so they were banned. So that is a praise report, and I'm very pleased to tell you, I don't know what role I had in it, but I had a role in it. And I spent a whole month in 2009 suffering for Christ in Switzerland. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was in uh, two trips in June, and in October of 2009, here I spoke in 23 cities, and... Um, so anyway, the first night in October when I spoke, they were ready. Uh, they were waiting for me. I spoke in a, a church in Switzerland in Wichtrach. Wichtrach is a little village outside of Bern. And a church with room for 550 people was packed. And at the back, there were three Muslims who taped me. And the next day, they went to the police. Actually, that night, they went to the police to file a complaint that I should be arrested and deported from Switzerland. And uh, by the way, I want to tell you, remember uh, Rodney Dangerfield? I don't get no respect. <laughs> you know, I've never been on the first page of the New York Times or any American paper. And I've never been on the first page of any Israeli newspaper. And the only country, well, before, when I was here, here at K-House, you know, I spoke about how I was um, uh, honored to make it to the first page of Saudi Arabia's biggest newspaper with my picture. <laughs> so this is as a result of my 2003 trip. So... Now the Saudis give me some respect. You can pray for me, of course. Um, but anyway, so the Swiss uh, newspapers, all of them were talking about Avi Lipkin. And let me tell you, it was such an ego trip. I mean, it, I wasn't there for an ego trip, even though it's nice to have an ego trip sometimes. The Muslims made, did the best. I love the Muslims. I make a living because of them. And... and they made sure to it that everybody in Switzerland knew who I was. You know, this is, I have to get the arrogant stuff out, you know. <laughs> Two nights later, I spoke in Burgdorf, which is another Swiss town. And little meetings, you know, 12, 200, 300 people. And then I saw four cops going and sitting in the back of the hall with handcuffs. And I knew that I was going to be taken straight to Zurich Airport and kicked out of the country. And at the end of the meeting, sure enough, they came up to me, and the commander of the gendarmes shakes my hand and says, Avi, you have a very important message for Switzerland. <laughs> anyway, meanwhile, the Muslims were following me around everywhere. And um, 
So I was not deported and I completed the mission. I spent two weeks in June, two weeks in October. By the way, I had a great time. Because as you know, in case you didn't know, I love the Christians. And I love the Swiss. And I became really very much at home in Switzerland. And I want to share one little story about Switzerland because it gives you an idea of how the Muslims operate. The story of Saudi Arabia happened because there was a gentleman there, of course I should say gentleman in quotes, uh, a journalist, newspaper man from Al Jazeera. How many people heard of Al Jazeera? And how many people heard that Hillary Clinton, Secretary of State, said that her favorite station is Al Jazeera? Okay. So I want you to know, I agree with Hillary Clinton. My favorite station is Al Jazeera. For my wife, it's the most hated station. But for me, it's my favorite station because I make a living from it. My wife also makes a living from it, but she hates it. I may sound a little incoherent. I'm going to explain this in a moment. Now, in case you don't know, I love to preach. And one of the greatest highs of any one of my trips is to come to Post Falls, Idaho, speak here at K House. And every time I see uh, Tracy, and every time I see Gordon and everyone who's here, I mean, I'm on a super high. I love everyone here. I love Idaho. I love the Pacific Northwest. Uh, don't be angry with me when I say my favorite city in the United States is Vancouver, BC. <laughs> the whole, there's something special about the Northwest. Seattle I like also, and Portland, I just, I'm, you know. Anyway, listen, it's not Texas and it's not Kansas City. I mean, Kansas City is okay also, but you know, flat, flat. I love the mountains and the forest. And the, everything is majestic and beautiful here. So, and I love to preach. I don't know what I would do if I were not preaching. So my wife calls me one day, and as probably most of you know, my wife is Jewish, like I am, but she is from Egypt. We both moved to Israel at the same time, at age 20, we're both the same age. So I'm Jewish, but I think like a Christian. Because praise God, I was born and raised in a Christian country, United States of America, the greatest of the Christian countries in the world. I hope it stays that way. And my wife was born and raised in the greatest of the Islamic countries, Egypt. And so my wife is Jewish, but she thinks like a Muslim. So you can imagine we have a very tempestuous relationship. <laughs> and my wife has been working for the last 26 years for the Israeli radio Kol Israel services of the Israeli government. And even though she's very modest and doesn't like to say it, but she's really an intelligence gatherer because she monitors what they say in Arabic. And I'm going to share a testimony with you, which will take five minutes. But it, and I've said it here at K House a few times in the past. It has to be repeated. When I was in uh, um, uh, Freiburg in Switzerland, the, the gentleman from, from Al Jazeera shows up, the guy who met me and my wife in 2003. And um, you know, he came with his cameras and everything. And he said, can I take some pictures of you? I mean, I knew who he was, and he knew who I was, and I remembered him. I said, only on one condition. I said, come here, give me a hug. And he was flabbergasted, you know, because we know we are each other's enemy. What did Jesus say? Love the enemy. And I love this guy. I really love this guy. I went over, I gave him a bear hug. We, I hugged him. I kissed him on both cheeks. I mean, he was going to die. <laughs> he couldn't figure this out. I've been so Christianized, it's terrible. <laughs> By the way, you know, when I go to the synagogue on the Sabbath and I say, you know, I said, I don't want to say Jesus, but, uh, you know, or JC from Nazareth. Either thing will get me thrown out of the synagogue. <laughs> but I say to the rabbi, I say, you know, I love the enemy. He said, where did you get that nonsense from? I said, well, if you don't know, it's okay. You know, I want to stay in the synagogue. I, lunch is waiting for me there, so. <laughs> and so I get up, and he's taking pictures of me and recording me, and all of a sudden, 20 other Muslims come in, and they're in the back. And uh, they, I think they're Southern Baptists. They all go to the back. <laughs> and, uh, and I told you the one about what's the difference between Southern Baptists and Northern Baptists. Northern Baptists go to hell. <laughs> That's a Southern Baptist joke. OK. Now, I just came from Texas yesterday. You have to excuse me. So I'm still in the Texas mode. And so I get up. And before I start my message, which actually was the message, I say, I want to honor my colleague 
uh, Tamer Abu Alinin from Al Jazeera, because he's a journalist and I'm a journalist. I am a founder and regular contributor to a magazine called Israel Today. How many people heard of Israel Today magazine? Okay. And um, so I'm a journalist. I've been writing articles for 14 years, founded a magazine. I, my name is on the marquee, so I suppose I'm considered a journalist. So I want to honor my fellow journalists from Al Jazeera, my favorite station. See, Hillary Clinton and I have a lot in common. <laughs> and I want you to know that Al Jazeera always tells the truth. When he heard that, I could see him sinking behind the pew <laughs> because he knew it, there was going to be incoming attack very soon. And, uh, you know, I have to tell you something. In the Middle East, and I, I'm going to explain to you the work my wife does. Al Jazeera is officially the arm of the country we know as Qatar. Qatar is a country which is 50-50 Sunni and Shiite, but the government is ruled by the Sunnis, but the Sunnis are so afraid of Iran, which is Shiite, that Qatar, though it's Sunni, it supports the Shiite cause. That, by the way, it's nothing to compare to the confusion we're going to have by the end of the evening. <laughs> now, if you want to know the truth about Qatar, you don't go to Al Jazeera. Al Jazeera's job is to cause a revolution in Egypt. Al Jazeera's job is to cause a revolution in Saudi Arabia. Everything at the behest of Iran. Now you understand why Hillary Clinton likes that station so much. Silence, okay. Now, if you want to know about Qatar, you watch Saudi TV. The Saudi TV will never tell you the truth about Saudi Arabia but the Saudi TV will hang out the dirty laundry of Qatar. And Qatar will hang out the dirty laundry of Saudi Arabia. So what my wife does is she watches these uh, programs and these TV stations, listens to their radio stations, reads their newspapers, and what the Arabs say about the other side is usually true. What they say about each other, you know, what the country says about itself, that you can throw in the garbage can. But if you want to know what's going on in the Middle East, you listen to what one country says about the other. Are you with me? Yes. So Al Jazeera is uh, reporting, is interviewing an Algerian terrorist from Algeria. He has been apprehended by the Algerian army. Um, and so the interview shocked my wife so much that my wife called me hysterically, crying. And she said, here you are, Avi, gallivanting around the United States, having a good time. Because, of course, if I'm preaching, I'm having a good time. In case you didn't know it, I love to preach. And here I am in Israel, crying my head off, listening to the craziest stuff in the world from Al Jazeera. Do you understand why she hates Al Jazeera? Now, you know, they say some of the best comedy comes from tragedy. So for me, everything is comical. And for my wife, everything is tragic. You see, we have a very special marriage. So I'm going to give you a little story about Algeria. And I mean, you all know that there is this massive implosion taking place throughout the Middle East today in many, many countries. And what happened in Algeria 20 years ago was a prototype. So I'm going to tell you about the, what's been happening in Algeria. And then from there, you'll understand what Al Jazeera is. This will be a good link also, by the way, between what's happening in Europe and what's happening in the Middle East today. Now, the history of Algeria is the following. You remember from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli? Now, that was called the Barbary Pirates. Now, the fact is, the word Barbary, it's not that they are barbaric, which they are. The word Barbary comes from the word Berber. The Berbers were the Moroccans, the Algerians, the Tunisians, and the Libyans in Tripoli. The whole North African coast was Berber. And what these people were doing for, for centuries, was taking slaves. Okay, now, the, they're, you know, I'm getting to ramble. I'm getting excited, so I ramble. How many people remember Keith Ellison from Minnesota? Yes. You know, your, your local friendly Muslim representative in the U.S. Congress. Yes. Keith Ellison, the guy who swore on the Quran. And he swore on the Quran of President Thomas Jefferson. Because, you know, the liberal media said to you, Thomas Jefferson was a liberal. Nonsense. He wasn't a liberal. Do you know why Thomas Jefferson had a Quran? He read the Quran 
After he read the Quran, he built the US Navy and sent it to attack the, the Muslims. Because what they were doing was they were taking US merchant marine ships. US, United States had no Navy in, in the 1780s and 1790s, the early 1800s. The US did not have a Navy. The US had merchant marine ships. America was one of those peaceful Christian countries that says, you know, he who lives by the sword dies by the sword. America didn't need wars. America, what it needed was to settle and colonize the land of America. And so when a ship would approach England or Spain or anywhere, the Barbary pirates, like the Somali pirates today, would take captive the ship. And the, of course, American sailors fetched the highest price on the slave market. And as you probably know, if you have a $100 bill, Benjamin Franklin appears there. Benjamin Franklin was the American ambassador to Paris, France. And he did everything he could to negotiate with these people, with the Islamic, by the way, the Islamic countries, the Islamic powers at that time, uh, all had embassies in Paris. And of course, no matter what the Americans offered, nothing worked. Sounds like the Israeli-Palestinian peace process. Yeah. <laughs> no matter what we offer, nothing is gonna work. By the way, you know, in America, there's a solution. They say to every problem, there's a solution, amen? In the Middle East, the saying is to every solution, there's a problem. And so Benjamin Franklin did not succeed in freeing any of the slaves, American merchant marine men. And so Thomas Jefferson wanted to understand who these Muslims were. And so he got himself a copy of the Quran. After he read the Quran, he said, guess what? We're going to build the US Navy, and then we're going to create the United States Marines, Semper Fi, and we're going to you know, take them out. Okay. And by the way, after this happened, you know what the Europeans did? The British did the same thing in 1817. Because after 1803, from the halls of Montezuma to the shores of Tripoli, the bottom line of the agreement was they wouldn't take American merchant marine sailors anymore as slaves, prisoners and slaves, but they never said that about the British Navy. And they were still raiding European coastlines all the way to Ireland, Portugal, Spain, Greece, Italy, these, these Barbary ships would come and kidnap men and women and take them as slaves. Because white slaves were valuable more than the black slaves in Africa. By the way, you know that President Obama's family in Kenya comes from the slavers. The legacy of slavery, the slavers, not, he wasn't from the freed slaves, he was from those who took the slaves. So Michelle should really think about that. <laughs> now, <laughs> sorry about that, anyway. Um, so in 1817, the British said, you know, we're going to do the same thing. And so there was an agreement between the Moroccans and the other Barbary countries not to take British as slaves. And then finally, you know what the solution was? The solution was to take North Africa and make it French colonies. And so the French sent their legionnaires in, and Morocco and Algeria and Tunisia became French colonies. Guess what? No more slavery in those countries. Italy took over Libya. No more slavery. The British took Egypt, Sudan. No more slavery. I mean, as long as the British were there. So by the way, slavery is back in Sudan. Slavery was never abolished in Africa and they never heard of the Emancipation Declaration. Slavery has never been terminated in Islam, and indeed Islam is a slavery system. Okay. 1962, Charles de Gaulle has had enough of the FLN. FLN was the revolutionary movement that fought for independence of Algeria from France. Who trained the FLN? The Soviets. And so you probably remember the name Ben Bella, Boumedien, Bouteflika. These guys were trained by the Russians, the Algerian leadership. 1962, they get their independence. 1992, they decide to have free elections. Big mistake. You know, Hillary Clinton and President Obama said, we need to have democracy in the Middle East. Oh, I think we should have democracy too, but slightly under different circumstances because you cannot have democracy 
in an Islamic country. You've got to get rid of the Islam. It's like saying, let's have democracy in Nazi Germany. Let's have democracy in Tojo fascist Japan. So in 1992, they had elections. Who won the elections? The Salafists. Who are the Salafists? The Salafists are like the Wahhabis. They're Al-Qaeda people. They're fanatic Muslims. And by the way, just to tell you a little bit of Algeria, Algeria used to have a Jewish community. It used to have a Christian community. And they are no longer there anymore. When the Algerians got independence, the Jews and the Christians disappeared. And you know the Muslim motto. We kill the Jews on Saturday because they're the Saturday people, and we kill the Christians on Sunday because the Christians are the Sunday people. And Jews and Christians have a lot of faults, but they're not stupid. And so they left Algeria. Algeria is a country that has no Jews or Christians, it has no Hindus or Buddhists, and it has no Shiites. They're all Sunnis. They are all Algerian Berbers. And uh, so anyway, so the Algerians had elections, and the fanatic Muslims won the elections. I mean, what we're seeing today in 2011 is a repeat of what we saw in Algeria in 1992. What I'm trying to do is to share past experiences in the Middle East so that we understand where the Middle East is today and where it's going tomorrow. Now, Everyone in Algeria is Sunni Muslim. But there are two types of Muslim. There is the true Muslim, and there is the infidel, heretic, and traitor Muslim. <laughs> now, if you serve in the Algerian military, trained in the Soviet Union, you are an infidel, heretic, traitor. What do Muslims do to infidel, heretic, traitor Muslims? By the way, I want you to know I pray for President Obama. You know why? His father biological father was a Muslim. His stepfather was a Muslim. You know what that makes him? A Muslim. Now, of course, he says he's a Christian. And if he's a Christian, you really need to pray for him. Because in the Quran, it says, if you were a Muslim and you abandoned Islam and you became a Christian, what's your sentence? Yeah. Death. And the fact that he's alive, you know, is a miracle, really, if he's really a Christian. Okay. Now, I don't want to say he's a Muslim. Some people get upset when I say that. Okay, now, <laughs> you know, you go to the Middle East and you ask any Jew, Christian, or Muslim, is Obama Muslim? Of course he's a Muslim. The only people who don't know he's a Muslim is the American people, but that's okay. American people are the greatest people on earth, let me tell you. <laughs> now, I feel like going into a diatribe about Alexis de Tocqueville and democracy in America. And, okay, we may do that. Actually, we will do that towards the end, about three, four hours from now. <laughs> I have to get wired up, I have to, you know. Okay, now, the story my wife was reporting from Al Jazeera was about a Swiss, not a Swiss, but I'm getting back to Switzerland, about an Algerian terrorist. He had been apprehended because he participated in a massacre in Algeria where an entire village was wiped out. Now, what's the story here? The men of the village served in the military. Again, all of this is on Al Jazeera. You wanna know the truth about Algeria, you go to Al Jazeera, because they will always badmouth any other country other than their own. The men of the village were all in the Algerian military, therefore they were infidels, heretics, and traitors. What do you do to infidels, heretics, and traitors? You kill them. So they wait for the men to go to the army at 6.30 in the morning, and then they are reconnoitering the village three, four days. They realize that by 6.30 in the morning, the women and children and elderly are left alone, undefended. They settle in on the village, and they say to the women, cook us a meal, and the women cook them a meal, then they have their meal, uh, they pop a hallucinogenic pills, then after they get on a high, they rape all the women, then they slit their throats, then they slit the throats of the children, and they slit the throats of the elderly, they basically kill everybody in the village, and of course it's not over. Then they go to their trucks, and they pull out electrical chainsaws, and then they saw off all the arms and legs of everybody they just killed. Because you see, it says in the Holy Quran, of course, President Obama calls it the Holy Quran, I don't. But it says in the Holy Quran, chapter 5, verse 33, listen carefully, because this applies to you too. In this case, it applies to the Algerian military. Anyone who makes war against Allah and his prophet Muhammad 
and spreads disorder in the land, we will kill, we will crucify, we will chop their arms and legs off, and we will banish from the earth. Thank you, Al Jazeera. That's what I said to Tamer Abu Laylin. By then, you couldn't see any of the Muslims. They were all hiding behind the pews. <laughs> Thank you, Al Jazeera, for always telling us the truth. That when these Algerian soldiers come home that night from the military and they find their families all raped, slaughtered, and demembered, chopped into pieces, because that's what it says in the Holy Quran. So this, of course, was also in the Swiss newspapers. And you know, in the Judeo-Christian Bible, it says very, very carefully, not only not to eat blood, you know, if you look at Acts 15 and Acts 21, the early believers came to James and Peter and said, well, if we're not Jews under the law, what do we have to keep? It says, don't eat meat offered to idols. Fornication, of course, meant with the temple prostitutes of the Canaanites and the Greeks and the Romans and Egyptians, because all those ancient religions were based on sexual acts. And don't eat blood and don't eat strangled. So, and we see this going all the way back to Noah. By the way, Noah wasn't a Jew. Noah was the father of all of us. And God says to Noah, don't eat any part of an animal while that animal is still alive. Now, you know, Japanese and Chinese and all these exotic Far Eastern nations, they, they, they eat squid and octopus and all kinds of stuff that's still alive. So God says, don't, you know, God says when you want to eat an animal, you slaughter it and drain the blood and then you eat the animal. Now, I'm not getting into legalisms now, forgive me for that, but what I'm saying is, if the Muslim book, the Quran, says to chop off arms and legs, and if the Bible of the Jew and the Christian says that the human body is the temple of God, and we should honor the human body, and we should respect the human body, we shouldn't um, do these terrible things that the Muslim's book, Quran, says to do. Because the, the book of the Quran is the antithesis of the Bible. See, what I was saying in Switzerland was that the Quran is not just another monotheistic holy book like the Judeo-Christian Bible, but it is the antithesis. And I said, only a god with a small g called Satan could call on Muslims to kill little children and women, slit their throats, and then sew off their body parts. This is not God. This is Satan. And I said in Switzerland, Allah is Satan. Islam is not a religion, but a psychosis, like Nazism, worse than Nazism. You've all heard me speak about this here. I may do it again later if at the end of the fourth, fifth hour. And I said that Islam, like Nazism, should not be tolerated in any country on the face of the earth. And so I was convicted. Do you understand why I was convicted? And I'm very honored to have been convicted because this puts me now in the same category as Kurt Wilders of Holland, Lars Hedegaard in Denmark, Sabatish in uh, Austria. You know, a lot of good people getting up in Austria. You know, the Sabatish in Austria, what was she saying? That Muslims are pedophiles that they're allowed to have sexual relations with little children, because Muhammad did. They're allowed to beat their women and kill their women, because it is in Islam, chapter 4, verse 34. You know chapter 4, verse 34 of the Quran. It says, Allah gave authority to men over women, because Allah created one superior to the other. Good women are obedient. I like that one. <laughs> I don't really get it at home, but I like it. If you fear disobedience in your women, because they have four, admonish them, send them to beds apart, and beat them. Beat them also means kill them, depending upon the extremity of the woman's misbehavior or the extremity of the insanity of the male. Okay. So that's pretty much the story of Switzerland. By the way, one postscript. Uh, I uh, went back to Israel. I hadn't been arrested, I hadn't been taken to court. And uh, December 14th, 2010, just a few months ago, uh, my wife calls me, also kind of desperate. Every time my wife calls me, it's desperate, you know. <laughs> She's crying and I'm laughing. And she says, there is this registered mail and they won't give it to me in the post office in Jerusalem. You have to send me a power of attorney 
to receive it. I said, you always sign for my registered mail. No, no, this, I need a power of attorney. So I faxed her a power of attorney, she got it, and it was an official document from the Israeli Ministry of Justice that they had been notified that uh, I had been convicted in Switzerland according to the Hate Act that I preached against another religion. And um, so, of course, I contacted the Swiss a political party, EDU, and uh, uh, they hired a lawyer for me. The lawyer went to the court, and the court said, well, you know, we sent Avi the papers, or the Arabs, the Muslims said that they would send them the papers, and the Arabs said that he never responded, therefore, we sentenced him in absentia. So I called the Israeli Ministry of Justice, and they said, well, we received the papers from Switzerland on September 16th, uh, we dealt with the papers, sent them to the Israeli postal authorities on November the 24th, and Avi Lipkin's wife picked up the papers December 14th. Of course, I'm in America at the time. And so the Swiss court now is verifying what I said about the dates. And uh, the latest word was that the Swiss judge basically froze all proceedings against me. Uh, probably what will happen is the verdict will be thrown out and then they will set another date in court so that I may have my day in court. Now the question then is, should I go to Switzerland and risk going to jail. There are three possibilities that are either I pay a fine, which means I admit to the guilt, or I go for community service. Community service means I go to the mosque to be re-educated, <laughs> which of course is a death sentence, or I go to jail, which is a death sentence, because guess who controls the jails in Switzerland? The Muslims. So my wife said to me, you know, before you go to jail in Switzerland, let me know. Uh, I will kill you myself. I don't want them to have the pleasure of killing you. So. <laughs> So, okay, so that's the story of Switzerland. I don't know yet what's going to happen. I will say, though, that October of 2011, which is a few months away, uh, the Swiss are having their general elections, and um, I don't know how this can be used, but it may be, indeed, that if the EDU party uses this properly, they will double, triple their numbers in the Swiss parliament. And, of course, if they work together with the Volkspartei, the Christian and the conservative parties will get 57% of the vote, I think, which means a Christian victory and the beginning of the end of Islam in Switzerland. So I'm hoping that finally, thank you. And so I'm hoping indeed that there will be a Christian revival in Switzerland. And uh, by the way, after my time in Switzerland, I had a great time there, the French banned the burqa. And so I think you are beginning to find a reaction in Europe to the Islamic imposition of their authority and basically the silencing of any freedom of speech. And by the way, this is the Israel Today magazine of February 2011. And of course, my article is here about the muzzling of freedom of speech in Switzerland. And so, you know, if anybody wants a subscription, you have the 800 number here, you can call them here in America, it doesn't cost anything, and I think it's $40 a year or something. And it's a good Christian magazine, so you should get it. Okay, so much for Switzerland and Europe, and we're updated on that. I want to talk now about um, the, what's happening in the Middle East. Going back to what I shared about 1992 in Algeria. And, you know, I want to tell you something, and I'm not picking on Obama, and I'm not picking on uh, Hillary Clinton. The State Department and the U.S. President's have been all uniformly uh, contrary to UN Resolutions 242 and 338. Israel was made a deal in 1979 by Jimmy Carter, and he could not refuse the deal. The deal was hand over Sinai, make peace with Egypt. And by the way, you know, I supported the peace with Egypt, even though it meant handing over Sinai three times. And... Um, I'm going to come back to the story of Sinai again, but I, what I want to say is that in the last few months, we've been seeing all these revolutions taking place in Islamic countries, and uh, the best is yet to come, or shall I say the worst is yet to come. Because you look at these Islamic countries, and they're all, uh, the way they are, 
because of the Islamic system, which is you never tell the truth, you know, steal, rob from your own people, kill your people, torture your people. It's a tragedy. And what does the State Department say about all this? Israel must stop the construction of the territories. Israel must stop settlement activity. It's not only Hillary Clinton. Before her was Condoleezza Rice, George W. Bush. By the way, it was George W. Bush. By the way, I'm no respecter of men. I attack Republicans and I attack Democrats. I still haven't found anything on the Tea Party people, and I'm lecturing to them, so I, I behave a little with the Tea Party people. UN Resolutions 242 and 338 said that Israel must hand over land for peace, and but Israel must negotiate with its neighbors for new borders which are secure, recognized, and defensible. Now, if the UN, which is no friend of Israel, says that Israel must have new borders, does that mean we go back to the old borders? No. What does the US president say, Republican or Democrat? Israel goes back to the old borders. June the 5th, 67. Borders which are not defensible. How many people have heard me talk about this in the past? Okay, I mean, it's not something new. It's in my books and it's in the CDs and DVDs that I've done here. Israel must be able to defend itself. If it cannot defend itself, it will be destroyed. And that means Holocaust B. Instead of the Nazis, it's the Muslims. And so Hillary Clinton and President Obama are just the most recent examples of American leaders saying that Israel must stop the settlements, Israel must stop the building, Israel must hand over the territories, go back to the borders of 67, which mean the uprooting of half a million Jews from their homes for a Palestinian state that does not want peace. By the way, you remember, we gave up Gaza for peace. Did we get peace? We got the opposite. Okay. How did the, these most recent revolutions start in the Middle East? The story starts in Tunisia. Tunisia, not known to be a radical Muslim country. Tunisia is kind of like Algeria. It's more of a secular Muslim country. You do have religious Muslims there, but it's a kind of a laid-back Muslim country. And there's this vegetable vendor, and he's pushing his cart with vegetables and fruits. And a policeman comes to shake him down. He wants a bribe. And he says to the vegetable vendor, where's your license? He says, you know very well I don't have a license. You know, it's a small town. Everybody knows everybody. And so the policeman arrests him, confiscates the cart. And then in the police station, a Muslim woman police officer slaps this fruit vendor in the face. The ultimate insult to a Muslim man. Because in Islam, you beat the women. They don't beat you. As soon as he was released from the police station, he poured gasoline all over himself and he self-immolated. That's how it all started. Because everybody in town knew the police and they knew this guy and they were fed up with the system. And so Tunisia, it's like throwing a, a lit match on gasoline or on dynamite. And yes, the Muslims today, the Arabs today, have Google, Facebook, Twitter, and this spread like wildfire. And from there it went to Egypt. From Egypt, it went to Libya, to Yemen. Bless you. As I'm speaking, I know this, hopefully this program that we're taping now will be aired a year, two years, 10 years from now. We are now beginning to see trouble in Syria. Syria is a whole story. We're seeing trouble in Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is a whole story. The entire Middle East is going up in flames. And it has nothing to do with Israel. It has nothing to do with the settlements, nothing to do with the territories, nothing to do with Jerusalem, nothing to do with the Palestinian issue. And you know, I have to tell you, I think sometimes, you know, forgive me for putting myself in God's place. I think God is up there looking down on us. And sometimes God gets just ticked off. 
What does God do when he gets ticked off? He reshuffles the deck. God is reshuffling the deck in the Middle East. And I want to review a number of things that could happen very much in the Middle East very soon. By the way, we're going to end this uh, program with chapter 29 in Ezekiel. How many people know chapter 29 in Ezekiel? Those of you Bible buffs, okay? Now, I knew chapter 29. I never talked about it because it wasn't really apropos just yet. Chapter 29 of Ezekiel is very apropos now. And I have to tell you, I've been so contaminated by Chuck Missler that we're going to do the Avi Missler teaching tonight on chapter 29 of Ezekiel. That'll be at the end of the program. My wife and I watch Arabic TV all the time in Arabic. Of course, Hillary Clinton does not watch Al Jazeera in Arabic. She watches it in English, which, of course, is a snow job. That's why she's so happy with Al Jazeera. And my wife is home crying, having to listen to this crazy stuff. Yeah, we were watching a program from Mecca, Saudi TV, and this imam was proudly saying about, in front of the black stone in the Kaaba, that Abraham was supposed to, so to offer Ishmael at the Kaaba in Mecca that Abraham and Ishmael built the Kaaba and Mecca. Ask any Muslim. And that Moses and Aaron and Jethro were there at the Kaaba and Mecca. Now, of course, I cover all of that in the case for Mecca, which is on the table, courtesy of Koinonia House. You know the little black boxes that the Jews wear called the phylacteries? How many people know what the phylacteries are that the Jews wear on their foreheads? And I get into trouble with the rabbis. I say, you know what, that's the Kaaba in Mecca. The rabbis want to kill me. <laughs> Are you saying we're Muslims? I said, no, we're not Muslims, but this is, predates Islam. And Jethro was there. And by the way, one of the names of, you have Mecca and Medina, the two holy cities of Islam. Medina in Arabic is called Yathrib. Yathrib is Jethro. Midian is Medina. Hello, you know, <laughs> that's what I said to the rabbis. They said, oh, the Bible's not a GPS. Excuse me. The Bible is a GPS. I don't care what anyone says. And those little black boxes on our foreheads were the gyroscopes leading us out of the triangular system to the cubic system. The triangular system was Pharaoh and the pyramids, and the cubic system was our freedom in the desert. By the way, you know, the Hajj is seven times going around the pilgrimage in Mecca, seven times going around the black stone. When we wrap the phylacteries on our arm, it's seven times we wrap around the arm. With a, I mean, there's so many things that if you have a little bit of thinking outside of the box, you can, you can see the parallels. And this is while we were still slaves in Egypt, Moses says to the children of Israel, put on the phylacteries, Exodus 13, here's twice. So this predates Islam, this predates Judaism, because Judaism really only begins at Mount Sinai. We're still slaves in Egypt when Moses tells us to put on the phylacteries. And he had been 40 years as an understudy to Jethro in the desert. Okay. And I, have, of course, I share this in the case for Mecca, and I share this in my most recent teaching, Creation versus Destruction, and uh, in the book, Islam Prophesied in Genesis. If we don't forget Midian, Medina, Midian was a cousin. Midian was the half-brother of Isaac and, I and Ishmael from Keturah. I mean, you've got to know the genealogies. Moses, when he killed the Egyptian taskmaster, he knew exactly where he was going. He was going to his cousin across the, across the pond, the Red Sea. Okay. And Saudi Arabia, I believe, will collapse. I think it's imminent. How does that affect America? The oil. So Libya collapses. How does that affect America? The oil. And you remember my testimony about what made America great was the barrel of oil, right? How many people remember what made America great is the barrel of oil? Okay. Of course, the answer to that is no, what made America great was Jesus Christ. But if you're one of the one world government, then you know it's the barrel of oil. And so God reshuffles the deck. He says, you want oil? Here. Here's Libya. 
Here's Gaddafi. You want oil? Here's Saudi Arabia. You want oil? Here's Bahrain. Here's Abu Dhabi. Here's Iran. And that's why Americans have to have a Christian revival to realize the true values that made America great, not the oil, not the mammon. Okay. So I know we're approaching the halfway mark on the taping tonight. And what I want to say to you is we haven't seen anything yet in the Middle East. The entire Middle East is going to change. It's already changing. It has already changed, but it's yet to change much more. And it will affect Israel. It will affect America. It will affect Christian Europe, or whatever is left of Christian Europe. It will affect Latin America, which used to be Catholic, but will be Muslim, God forbid. And I want to give you a hint as to what we're going to talk about in the second hour. You know, the Egyptians used to have Jews and Christians. The Egyptians used to have French and Italian and many different nationalities were in Egypt. Abdul Nasser got rid of the French and the Italians and the Greeks first, then the Jews. By 1969, the last Jews left Egypt. There were like 100, 200 old people left, but my wife was among the last hardcore group of young Jewish people. And when my wife and her family left Egypt, her Christian girlfriends were saying to her, we're very sad to see you leave because once they have finished off the Saturday people, they come after the Sunday people, the Coptic Christians. And how many people know that the Coptic Christians do not have a good time in Egypt? How many people know that? How many people know there's a terrible persecution of Christians in Egypt? Now, the Christian Egyptians, the Coptics, are also called the people of the book by the Muslims. You know, Jews and Christians are one people. How many people know that Jews and Christians are one people? In Arabic, we're called the people of the book. Again, the only difference in the eyes of Islam between Jews and Christians is that Jews keep the Sabbath on Saturday and Christians keep the Sabbath on Sunday. Therefore, kill the Jew on Saturday, kill the Christian on Sunday. So they finished off the Jews in Egypt, Algeria, Tunisia, Libya. There are like 5,000 Jews in Morocco. There are like 7,000 Jews in Turkey. And there are like 20,000 Jews in Iran. Other than that, there are no Jews in the Middle East anymore. They finished off the Jews. And they finished off the Christians in many countries. They're finishing off the Christians in many countries. Now, the Christians in Egypt are business people. They are hard-working, industrious people. The Muslims, on the other hand, some of them are hard-working, but by and large, the Egyptian people are very lazy. Egyptian people don't like to work, the Muslims. They like other people to work for them. Um, the Christians are very Western-minded. They work very hard, and much of the Egyptian economy is based on the Coptic Christians in Egypt. Now, what happens to the Egyptian economy if tomorrow there are no more Christians in Egypt. What happens? Goes, tanks go south. The Egyptian economy collapses. I am predicting here tonight that unless, unless there's a miracle, the Coptic Christians will be terminated in Egypt. The fanatic Muslim Brotherhood will come to power in the elections in September. It will be the, basically the end of the Egyptian Christians. They will leave. What happens to the Egyptian economy when the Christians leave Egypt? The economy goes down. What happens when the economy goes down? You have 70 million Muslims in Egypt starving. In other words, this revolution that President Obama so welcomed is going to lead to the, basically the implosion of the Egyptian economy. Because no international business corporation will invest in an economy of a country that kills its Christians. Can you imagine you know, Warren Buffett or Intel, who spend billions of dollars to work with Israel, going to Egypt when the people they send get murdered by the Muslim Brotherhood because they're Christians or at least they're not Muslims. And so I ask you, we're going to take our break now in a moment. I ask you, where will 80 million Egyptians go when you have famine and massive starvation, chaos and anarchy in Egypt? Where are they going to go? They're going to go to the Europe, Canada, United States, and Latin America. Now, it says in Ezekiel 29, and we're going to do that a little later, 
It says the Egyptians will be scattered among the nations. That's God's word. Have the Egyptians ever been scattered among the nations? This is a prophecy that has not yet happened. It will happen because it's God's word. And it says the Egyptians will leave Egypt, which becomes a desolation, and they will go to the countries or surrounding Egypt, which are also desolations. Amen? Isn't Libya a desolation? Isn't Algeria? Isn't Tunisia? Aren't these Saharan countries all desolations? You see, because where the Christians and the Jews are, it's green. Because Christians and Jews answer God's call to tend the garden. Wherever Islam goes, it becomes desert. Because their God is the devil. Do you understand why I was convicted in Switzerland? And I stand proudly by every word I said. The threat of Islam is not a threat against Israel. It's not a threat against America. It's not a threat against uh, Christianity. It's a threat against the human race. The Islamic system is a threat to the Muslims. And they're human beings. And they're not bad people. They just want to eat. They want to feed their families. They're going to come to Europe. They're going to come to America. You're going to have a tsunami of Muslims coming from all over the Middle East. You have 400 million Arabs, and you have over a billion Muslims that are not Arabs. There's going to be massive starvation. And America, I'm very afraid to say, is making plans to take in tens of millions of Muslims. You all heard of resolution or government uh, decision 1388 in Washington to take in 20,000 Hamas people from Gaza. How many people heard about that in the last few days? Okay. So, and I'll conclude by saying I have nothing against the Latinos, of course, because they're Christians, but the 12 million illegals in America will be granted an amnesty. Firstly, that will give the Democratic Party victory in 2012 elections. Secondly, that will clear the deck for the next wave of tens of millions of illegals and others coming in from everywhere. And you know what? America will be vying to receive them, I believe. Vying to receive them, because the more America's population grows, from 300 to 400 to 500 million people, the more the GDP grows. When the GDP grows, the economy grows. And if Europe gets 100 million Muslims, America wants 100 million Muslims. Why does America want NAFTA? Because you have the Mexican, Canadian, American populations, 500 million. That'll counterbalance the 350 million in Europe. So you're not talking now about God or about Christianity. You're talking now about economics. The more people you have in America, the more powerful the economy eventually becomes. And I am not saying to reject these Muslims. What I'm saying is if they want to be in a Judeo-Christian Western civilization country, they must be Judeo-Christian Western civilization people. And, it, and if you don't make it very clear that anyone who comes to this country must behave in a manner appropriate for this country, meaning to renounce the Quran, which says that believers take neither the Jews nor the Christians for your friends. They're your, they're, they are friends with one another. Whoever friends the Jew and the Christian will become one of them. Allah does not guide the wrongdoer. So if the Muslims, according to the Quran, must not be your friends, what are they? Your enemy. So if you want 100 million Muslims, they have to not be Muslims anymore. Do you understand why I was convicted in Europe? I can't go to Europe. I will be extradited to Switzerland. I can't go to Canada, just across the border anymore. So praise God, I have two passports, American and Israeli. And I think America will keep me busy. Praise God. So thank you. Let's take our break now. Koinonia House is a nonprofit Christian ministry that is supported by the purchasing of materials and donations. To learn more about Koinonia House and the materials that we have available, visit khouse.org. And please be responsible in the sharing and dissemination of this information and respect the copyrights therein. Thank you.